You're listening to the College Light Bulb, presented by the Coaching Educator, where we illuminate your college path. Here's your host, Rebecca M. Carroll. Welcome. I have a visitor, and I'd like you to introduce yourself and what do you do? So, well, I'm Brett Clancy. I'm the owner of Christian Brothers Automotive in Meridian, Idaho. So I own and operate a uh, franchise business here that we fix everybody's cars, everything from an oil change to a new motor. Well, I have to tell you that um, I come from construction and it was always noticeable that our trucks are cleaner than everybody else's. And when I went into your business, I, I could not believe, I could believe, but it was nice to see how clean everything is. I mean, it's just, you really feel comfortable leaving your car in the parking lot. You feel comfortable going in and looking at whatever they're working on. So it's it's really nice. And you have a very nice waiting room because I had to do some work and I didn't want to leave that area. So I, I got a ton of work done. So Awesome. That's, that, that's our hope, you know, is people be comfortable there. And, and that's how I discovered Christian Brothers. I used to have a job where I traveled a lot. And every time I had a chance to get my oil changed, I went to Christian Brothers and sat there and worked. And actually, some of the most productive work I ever did was in their <laughs> waiting room. So, so I, uh, I was a customer before I was an owner. And, yeah. uh, so I, I love it. So I know you have a really interesting educational story. And so far, everybody does. I know a little bit more about Brett only because you're in my networking group. So I, I really um, have enjoyed some of your story. But what we'd like to do is ask, this is our career series, and we mm -hmm. want to create a situation where people can have an opportunity, students, parents, an opportunity to talk to someone because some people might say, a gas station, but you're not a gas station <laughs> at all. No. It, and so you don't have gas. There's a gas station next to you, but you do you do how many bays you have eight bays and you do so we have nine bays nine and okay I have five technicians working in those nine bays i did notice that you have two bays for each technician yep that is helpful yeah and then it's it's good because once you figure out the car and sometimes you've got to pull it apart it may sit there for a while while we wait for the parts and sometimes we've disassembled it to a point you can't really move it so uh, that way the technician can move on to another car and work on that till the parts come in and, and so we kind of coordinate all that. That's helpful because I have had, not at your place, another place put someone else's car part in my car. Oh. <laughs> Which can happen if you think about that they only have so many bays and they're trying to pack up and they need a part. So tell us about your education. So. Well, from high school on. Yeah, so I, I went to a, a Catholic high school and where the focus was go to college, go to college. Um, but back then I didn't know somebody like you. So, uh, and my parents were very much against borrowing money. So I looked in my pockets and there was no money for college. <laughs> and so uh, I, this was back in the, you know, 1981. So going in the military was not the popular thing to do. And I don't even think it was talked about. No, it was actually very, my college career counselor was very disappointed in me that I was going to go in the military. And mm -hmm. so, um, but, you know, for me, it was a good choice because I was kind of undecided what I wanted to do. And, and, you know, I was an average student. I was kind of average at everything, but really not engaged. And yeah. so going in the military for me was, um, was awesome because I knew exactly what I had to do to get to where I wanted to go. And it was a uh, environment that I really thrived in. Now uh, you did, am I right in thinking Coast Guard? Yep, I was in the Coast okay. Guard. We haven't had a Coast Guard person for a while. So I don't even think I've, we've interviewed a Coast Guard person. So tell us about that. Why did you choose the Coast Guard? Well, we're a very mysterious bunch. Um, there's a thing called Coast Guard mystique. <laughs> that, uh, nobody quite understands. Um, but um, actually, I was going to join the Marine Corps. Okay. And because my dad was a Marine and to this day, I, I think this was God's providence, but it was the, the recruiter said he was a old, this old gunny sergeant, been to Vietnam and done all that. And he said, well, because your dad's a Marine, you need to get his permission to join the Corps. Oh. And I said, really? Because I'm expecting him to just sign me up and run me down 
get me on a train and head me to boot camp. And, yeah. Uh, but he's, no, nope, you need to talk to your dad. And so I went and talked to my dad and my dad said, absolutely not, which was very Really? <laughs> was said, there, were you shocked? Yeah, I was disappointed. He says, you'll just be a rifleman. And I said, that's what I want to be is a rifleman. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, he says, and he said, um, he said that uh, he just wanted me to do something else. And so he says, he, and my dad threw out the Coast Guard. And so I promised him that I would go talk to the Coast Guard. But then if I didn't like it, I was going to join the Marine Corps. Oh, And okay. he said, agreed. So he was pretty, he was, my dad was a gambling man. So he was placing his bets that I was going to get sold. And so, you know, I went to the Coast Guard and the whole time they were trying to talk me out of it. And I kept thinking they were trying to keep something from me. <laughs> Oh, really? So so I learned later in, as I became a sales guy that that's called the takeaway clothes. So oh. dangle it out there and then take it away and then they really want it. So, okay. <laughs> so, so I joined the Coast Guard and, and actually it was very good for me and uh, just really set me some great lifelong things that I still are part of my personality today. So, so were you on a ship or a boat? Both. So there are two Coast Guards. There's the, um, the search and rescue guys that run the little boats that go out there and save people. And okay. then there's the big ships that actually have a military mission. And uh, so I started out on the little boats. Uh, I was digging ditches and painting stuff and uh, just never got to really ride the boats. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought, what's the fastest way I can get out of here? And so the weapons division was... They told me if I signed up for this class, I'd be gone in a month. And I said, perfect, because I was I was out in the middle of the forest and there was nothing out there. It was an isolated duty station, and which most Coast Guard small stations are that way. And uh, so I signed up and actually a week later I was gone. And wow. So I went to, uh, so basically became part of the Navy at that point because the Coast Guard and the Navy work very close together. So. I was one of 10 Coast Guardsmen at Great Lakes Naval Training Center for 18 months. I'm going okay. to a very high level weapons school. It's actually that at the time was the toughest school the Coast Guard offered. And, uh, but because I had good, uh, yeah, I had decent SAT scores, but my, my ASVAB scores were high. really good. Yeah, yeah. So I could do whatever I wanted to. So I got, got in there, hung in there for that school and, um, now, did they, they at this point, are you back from boot camp? So you were back from boot camp in the small boat arena, yep. didn't like it. So then you went to where they do boot camp for the Navy. Correct. Yeah. It, well, yeah, boot camp is that's there, where my son's in the Navy. So that's yeah. where we went for his. His graduation. Yes. Yeah. No all, cameras. But all the schools are there, too. So, um, okay. so there's the, on one side is the recruit training center. The other side is all their their weapons schools are right there. So, so we so we were in there. So the Coast Guard didn't have that weapons system school, so they sent me there. So were you getting trained on the lakes? Yeah. Well, actually, we never were on a ship or anything. There it was all okay. classrooms, highly academic. Um, but it started off with basic electricity, and so it's kind of a blue collar um, technician kind of training. But in the military, when you go to school there, it is. 10 hours a day, eat, live, sleep it. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, they make you very good, very fast mm -hmm. at a specific uh, system that you're working in. So, and you want to pass it because if you don't, oh, then the penalty you are at, yeah, you are cleaning <laughs> toilets. So. Yes, if you're lucky. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was afraid they'd make me put a Navy uniform on for <gasps> So, <laughs> my son's in the and yes. I do like those blue uniforms. Yes. I, I think the Cracker Jack uniform is really great. Yeah, the Coast Guard made a big mistake when they got rid of that. So. Oh, what are they? What are their uniforms? It's called it's called the Bender Blues, and it's named after a, um, our commandant named Bender, who came in, decided we needed to look more like we were in the Air Force, which was oh. kind of cool because the Coast Guard uniform has gold buttons. Okay. On their Air Force uniform, which makes sailors think you're an officer. Oh. And so I would get saluted We'll a have lot. to put a picture up of that. <laughs> yeah. I, it, they, uh, they, I got saluted a lot. Oh, <laughs> and then they figured out I was just an enlisted guy. So. Oh. So now, how long do you enlist in the... So, can, can you so sign was, up for a certain amount of time? Yeah, it was or? a four-year enlistment. Okay. And uh, almost extended just because I wanted to go to uh, Japanese school which was a, uh, a totally immersive 
Um, they send you to Okinawa, Japan, and you get totally immersed in Japanese culture because we dealt with a lot of Japanese fishermen mm -hmm. and Koreans, and, and so it's a handy language to be able to be at least have a working knowledge of. So I had put in for that, and they had told me I could do it, but then I was going to have to extend my enlistment for a couple of years, which was going to turn into a whole lot of other things because the gun system I was working on was actually um, becoming obsolete, and I was going to have to go to that school which was going to you know, be another four years. So, And at this point, are you, have you met your lovely wife? Have you not? I have not. And, uh, oh, so, okay. So you were kind of free ranging yeah. and you could have done this. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I could have gone either way. And, and, but my family had a business. It was the uh, uh, doors and millwork. So kind of similar to uh -huh. being in the construction business. Um, I, you know, my dad was encouraging me to, you know, do your four, come out and work in the family business. And so okay. that's what I did. So you know, so, so yeah. you have a taste of family business. Mm -hmm. That probably is why it appeals to you to have a business. Yes. It's, you know, everybody in my family's kind of entrepreneurial. Yeah. So okay. entrepreneurial is yeah. a fun word to say. But uh, yeah. So it's kind of uh, like FAFSA. Yeah. <laughs> but still, you know, there was no GI Bill back then. There was this was in what? between. Oh yeah, this was between Vietnam and and everything else that was that we all have been living with now for twenty years. But every, everybody was not very happy with the military and the, the veteran experience today is much different than mine. Well, uh, it, especially if you understand and, and when actually, to check the box, because I have there's still people who go through boot camp who when they you know, heard you in and explained, oh, we're going to give you the GI Bill, but you have to yeah. first sign off. And some don't. Yeah, it's, it's just, whoa, because they think, I think the first couple times they take $80 or something out of your paycheck. And yeah. some people feel like that's a lot. But I'm happy to say my son is... Yeah, drank but, the full gallon of punch on that deal, and he's going to do very well. Yeah, so. I know. It's just, I mean, that's eighty six thousand yeah, dollars to play around with. That's real money. Yeah, you know, that'll get you whatever you want to do. But so I, not even the Montgomery, you could not use the Montgomery. So you must have been right wedged in between. Yeah, there was nothing yeah. there. There was a thing called Veep, which was you put in a dollar, they matched it with two. Okay. Uh, the problem was when you're in the Coast Guard and you're on a Navy base that you can't manipulate your pay. So I kept trying to do that. And, and of course it just, it, the paperwork just never got from point A to point B. Okay. So this was no computers back then, no fax machines, no nothing. Yeah. It was all write this, <laughs> Have give this it to this guy saw. and trust him that yeah. he's going to follow through. And it never did. So, so we were, you know, now I'm working with my father and uh, met my lovely now, wife. Now mill work. They, mm -hmm. I, are we talking? You're doing um, building walls and with. Now we so if if you build a house, somebody uh -huh. puts the doors in there. Okay. And then all that casing that goes around. All right. That's that's the millwork, and so that's what we did, and we did all the hardware for that. And it's one of those industries nobody thinks about. Yeah. How did those doors get here? Well, there's a guy that that's all he does is doors. And my dad had been in the door business for years and years and years okay. and then started his own company. And then I was part of that. And my other brother was part of that. And actually, both my brothers were part of it at one point. So, but uh, sometimes working with your dad is Isn't, a little bit tough. There might be a reason why I don't work with my father and never have worked, other than when I was in high school and we yeah. all were doing the summer stuff. You had to. I mean, we, there were just to get it to where it is today because all of us kids worked it which was great because we learned a lot about working hard and doing something you wouldn't necessarily want to do but no i i'm not there only three have gone into the family business and yeah. there are some grandchildren but not my children yeah my son my brother stayed in the business but uh and yeah, my dad um I, I have never had a boss that it has come close to anything of working like working for my dad. So <laughs> it's it, it actually prepared me very well to work for a variety of a lot of different kind of people, and uh, you know it was good. But um, you but know, you met your wife. Yeah, and she wasn't happy. And she was pointing out that you know I needed to do something else too. <laughs> you know, wives are good about that. Yeah. And uh, but we put her through school first, and 
So she went to school full time and okay. we got grants and, and we worked and we paid for it. And she got a great job as an x-ray technician. Oh, yeah. Which she's been doing for over 30 years now. And, and uh, we've lived in four different states and she has always had a job within days of arriving oh, there. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's been a great, uh, great profession for her. And uh, but the, when the only way she would go to school is if I promised that when she graduated, I would go to school. And so I kind of half said, yeah, I'll do that. But I was thinking in terms of, yeah, she'll forget about it. But she didn't forget. So <laughs> so at this point, did you know what you wanted to study? Well, I knew it was going to be business because I, I did know I did learn one thing from working with my dad. My dad was an awesome salesman, could sell anything, but he really had no understanding of how business works, like the back end, how numbers flow. And, and by looking at a financial statement, you can say, hey, we got a problem here. Yeah. That we need to do. He had no, his thing was if I got no money in the bank, I just need to go out and sell more stuff. And that sales fixed everything for him. But there was, there was some big problems in there. And we were growing to a point where the company needed to be professionally run, you know, by the numbers. Yeah. And but that scaling is tough. And, yeah. and if anything, you, you make less because you're giving more to the business because of the scaling and yeah. people don't understand that. It's like, yeah, you, you, it's a, a percentage yeah. of what it is you're doing. It, it actually gets smaller, but you know, you still, um, if you're in business, your goal is to expand. That's whatever that means to you yeah. um, as a person, as a business, as your ability to serve others, community involvement, whatever that is, you know, that looks at you, you know, the purpose of business is to expand. And so if you're doing it well, you will expand. And so my thought was, a, you know, okay, I'm going to go to school full time, but I'm going to come back to this. And I'm going to, I want to, I want to learn how the books work. And I want to come back and run the back end of the business, but okay. run it professionally. And so that was kind of my initial goal. And so Started off at community college and took all the, you know, took a business focus, uh, also a computer science focus, because computers were becoming a thing that we thought were oh, probably yeah. going to stick around. And, uh, and so um, I thought I'm going to learn both. Um, I later found out that I just was not wired to be a computer guy. Um, so I just became an accounting major. Okay. And so uh, that was my, my goal. So I went to two years of community college. Then I applied to the University of Washington School of Business, which at the time I didn't realize was so all that. I just thought, you know, that's where I need oh, to go great. to school. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, it's that's hard to get in. People think, yeah. oh, I'm just going to apply to that school. And it's like uh, there's kids who have gotten into really high-end private schools that get into those and don't get into yeah. it's popular very difficult but i you know i did all the things jumped through all the hoops and i got accepted and you know back then uh this the school of business uh for the university of washington was a top 10 business school in the public sector and we went to we were in the cheapest crummiest dirtiest building on the entire university of washington campus I remember they had um you know, computers had been coming in now for about three, four years, and we were actually being required to do things like get on this thing called the interweb <laughs> and go to South Carolina to download our test onto a, you know, but you couldn't do this at home. You did this at school with these big giant computers, and, yeah. and then it came out on this thing, and you had to write the test and then feed it back in. it back into another server in another college. So everything was .edu because the universities were the only ones that really had access to this. And so um, that and the government, but um, it was, um, it was fun because the, um, we had these big just bundles of wires that were like nailed to the walls in this old school. And then there was like crude holes cut in the floors where the wires would go up to the second <laughs> floor. And, and, you know, and it was, but we didn't think anything of it. We thought, this is awesome. We've got computers. Yeah, and uh, and I was actually I bought a it's called it was called a two eighty six. I bought this computer because I really wanted time. I wanted more because it was really hard. You had to get this card and wait in line for yeah. time on the computer, and then when your time was up, your time was up. Get out. So I I bought a computer and I was doing you know my using it for basically a typewriter and a spreadsheet machine and <laughs> and uh, but it wasn't really sophisticated by any means but anyway I, I uh, we graduated from there and uh, during my tenure in school my father actually passed away 
Oh. One of the things. Another, was that surprising? No, another lesson I learned when you don't have a, um, a good handle on your business, you make it up with hustle. Hustle catches up and dudes like that drop dead of heart attacks. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, actually we ended up, me and my brother sold the business and and we we owned the building so we set my mom up with the building and my brother took all the customers and started doing this kept doing the same thing but he was just in a fresh business without yeah. the well and we weren't doing the manuf he wasn't doing the manufacturing anymore because we would do everything from the sale to the manufacturing to the install delivery everything oh. so he just went to just the pure sales and had other people do all that and has done very well. He's been in that business for 35 years, 40 oh, years good. now. So, um, but um, uh, so here I was, I said, well, I guess my plan just went out the window. And, and uh, so I got recruited by Freightliner Corporation and uh, Freightliner, if you don't know what those are, those are the big giant semi trucks you see driving oh, down yeah. the road. So yeah. uh, they're uh, basically sold just like cars and through a dealership. Uh, and so I was recruited to be a, a management trainee. So the goal was that I would either go into the accounting side of the dealership or even into general management. And so um, one of the things is, a, as an accountant, you can go two different ways. You can be a CPA where you learn tax and all that. I took one tax class and thought, there is no way I'm doing this. I hate taxes. <laughs> well, and then you have to keep learning all oh, yeah, the new things. Well, you still do anyway, but, but you know, yeah. yeah just to learn about tax was horrible. Um, so I, I went the managerial round. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a big function of accounting just in the management of business. So that's analyzing financial results to, you know, how do you price things? How do you sell things? How do you set margins? Uh, there's just a ton of things. How do you prepare all the paperwork for that CPA to go do your taxes? Yeah. And uh, there's a lot to it. And, and actually I, really had favored accounting because it's the language of business. Yeah. And so no matter what I did, I could, I knew I could, I had the right background. So, you know, the, the big thing was, is a lot of people get pigeonholed into, well, I have a finance degree, so I can only do finance. And that's not true. Yeah. It, it's when you get that bachelor's degree, that's just the beginning of your education. And um, we used to say in the martial arts, when you got your black belt, that is the beginning of your training. You know, yeah. now you can begin. So it's there's never an end to your education. So, um, so with that degree, I got recruited to them. Uh, became a uh, kind of a rising star. Things went very fast, and uh, within two years, I was the controller of a dealership and was relocated to Florida. Um, wow! And, and did you like the Florida weather? Uh, well, the Florida weather was tough to tough to uh, adjust to, but I loved the beaches. I loved the um, sun was shining every day. I'm a kid from Seattle. Yeah. Well, oh, this was yes. a novel that's, thing. You know, that's I, true. I never thought. I of used that. to get up every day and pinch myself because the sun was still out, and I yeah. couldn't believe it. And uh, so we just kind of you know raised all my kids down there. Um, I, I very soon you know within a few years kind of got. Um, discouraged with the, uh, you know, the whole automotive, um, you know, that, you know, just some of the people in, that I was dealing with were not really good people. And so, uh, you know, at some point you have to make a choice. Um, if, if I don't fit here, I can stay here and be miserable or I can find a place that I fit. And so, so we, I decided, I told my wife, I said, I think we're marooned here because <laughs> I'm going to leave this company which my wife was very happy to hear. So your wife yeah. is also a good measure. Uh, they see a lot of things going on in you before you do, so. Well, I mean, it just, you know, I mean, I work in a field that requires a lot of ethics. And so, yeah. and that's a field most fields do. And um, I've been very surprised. You know, when people say, why don't you work for a school? Well, it, it's great with the leadership. My first principal, was a Naval Academy graduate and he was wonderful. And he actually was from that area and he went to that high school. So there was so many really great connectors for him and he really cared about the community. I've worked for two other principals, scary. Mm -hmm. Just, and when you know things are going on 
and you do as much as you can strategically to either make people aware of it or try to change things within the process that's in front of you, which I believe in, and it doesn't work, I that's why I'm yeah, independent. I, I, I think <laughs> a lot of people make a mistake of saying, hey, there's a process we can change this, this is wrong. And yes, it very well may be wrong, um, but your ability to change it mm -hmm. may not be there, and so you just think, decide that, your energy? You, yeah. you know, uh, I can stay in this fight for nothing or I can move on and find a, something that fits me better. And, you know, so we did. I actually went from there and became a, a financial advisor with Edward Jones. Um, so, oh, OK. So uh, and I uh, started <laughs> that two years before we um, they blew up the World Trade Center. Ooh, and uh, yeah. the two years afterwards were very hard to be a financial planner because everybody was planning that the world was going to end and that re America wasn't coming back. Yeah. And uh, however, I've always been a big believer that, you know, America might take a knee in there every now and then, but she always stands back up. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and I'm waiting, you know, I'm waiting for us to stand back up now. Uh, but that's a whole other story to give you. Because <laughs> um, this next field is going to be politics. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So that'll be a different guest for you. But, uh, um, but I, uh, you know, we, we did that and they did very well. Again, my accounting background helped me a lot to understand business, how to understand those things. But I learned in that business uh, how to be, uh, be in sales, how to market, how to network with people, how to... You know, I'd gone from behind the scenes to in the front row. And so, again, an, an accounting degree, while that everything says, you know, you should be adding up ledgers and stuff, but here I am selling stocks, bonds, right. mutual funds, and, and helping people plan for their retirement. Um, loved it. Um, it was it was a lot of work, and uh, you know, I was very dedicated to it. But, you know, you do get to a point where you're, uh, you're starving to death, and you've been starving to death, and when your wife says, game over it's game over so, so i went <laughs> well, back I to like the, you in the suit and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I went back to the automotive world i went so i had a lot of clients that were actually in the automotive world and uh, had a really good friend friend that ran an automotive paint and body shop supply company um and so after working for him for about a month i gave him my month's notice because he had some people in that his organization that i I didn't like what they were doing. And um, this was one of those things where he, it was one of those moments of truth. And uh, he just said, you know, before you quit, I says, just answer me this. And he asked, asked me what I would do if I were him. And I said, well, you know, you hired me to be a salesman and, and we were selling a new product. And I was thoroughly enjoying that. And I said, but I'll tell you what, if you'll go read my resume, because I know you didn't, uh, over the weekend, I will come back and work Monday and I will tell you what I think you should do. And then you can take it or leave it. And he said, fine, perfect. So I went home and, and I, uh, you know, he had a few things going on with it. his controller was uh, basically not good. And then he had a general manager that was crazy. So I said, um, what I would do is um, you fire those two guys and I will take over both their functions. And I will get you into the 20th century with your accounting. Uh, we'll use a computer. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was using pencils and paper. And I said, you know, I graduated in 1995 with an accounting degree. We never, ever did we take a pencil and put it in a ledger book. Yeah. Ever. And I said, you know, I'm, I said, I'm going to tell you right up front, it's going to be a challenge to go back and try to figure out what he was doing. You know, I don't know if it's accurate or not. Well, so. and that's the scary part when you're just yeah. using a ledger. Yeah, so um, so I kind of put it out there and figured out he'd get back to me. He says, he says, I like it. Let's do it. I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now we gotta now we gotta make it happen. So it was a uh, it was a great great experience for me and uh, to be basically take a business that was doing you know a couple million a year mm -hmm. uh, with three locations. Um, we ended up computerizing everything. Um, I brought in somebody to do the day-to-day -day accounting once I got it set up. And then I turned my, uh, my focus on, you know, just general business management. Uh, we ended up um, riding through the 2008 uh, recession uh, with three stores. 
uh, bought our competitor out because we were in a very good, t you know, we were not in debt. We, we had no debt. We had cash in the uh, reserves. And so when one of our competitors was about to go out of business, we bought their locations. And then we brought our, you know, as the, everything rose back up, we, we, we left, I left him there with five, five locations doing you know, over 5 million in, in revenue a year. And, and we, uh, discovered Christian brothers. So, yeah, uh, but it got to where, you know, I just wanted to be in business for myself. So, but so that's why you were happy there. Mm -hmm. You ended up, you kept going in for your oil change to this Christian brothers. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide you wanted to be part of that franchise? Well, it was, it was an interesting thing. I, yeah, I really liked <clears throat> working for my friend. Um, we were, we were good friends. We went to church together. We actually, determined that we wanted to make the, the company a Christian company at one point, And we did a lot of work to make it that. Um, yeah. and, it, and by Christian company, a lot, what, what that doesn't mean is that we just bring all a bunch of Christians and we have this little cohesive, you know, it's not that at all. It was that we aligned our company values with biblical principles. And, uh, and then we managed according to that. And, um, and it's amazing when you do that, you know, the Bible is the best, um, business book ever written. Yeah, and so it you, has more um, everything about money. Like there's more of that than even prayer. Yeah, everything you read about that, you know, as far as you know, the motivational speakers and everything is just rehashing what's already in there. Um, but we, uh, you know, in doing that, you know, I, I, uh, I, I kind of got bored. You know, we, the company was going big. Uh, we were uh, poised to buy another. To two locations, um, and I just thought, you know, uh, there's really nothing new for me here, and so I thought I really need to own what I'm doing. And meanwhile, I had done a, so with when we had five stores. My Mondays were I would get in my car and I would drive to each store, spend some time with each store manager, and it was about a 300 mile loop. And so uh, I was watching them build this building near one of our paint stores, and. I read in one of our trade magazines that uh, Christian Brothers was opening in its first location in Florida. And I didn't know who Christian Brothers was, didn't know what it was, but I read about it. I said, huh. And they said it was a faith-based automotive company. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And so I kept watching them build this thing. And one day there was a bunch of guys in golf shirts and khakis standing out there. So I pulled in and introduced myself, and it was the owner. Oh, and, uh, good. So I started just stopping there for oil changes and I do work in there and in their lobby and, and uh, just kind of like you did in ours. And, and I really liked it. And I, but I was really kind of listening and seeing how they dealt with customers. And I just felt like that was really in line with, with what I, how I felt a business should run and how customers should be treated. And it turned out they had a list of, you know, the founder had come up with a list of like 30 things that really suck about getting your car fixed. Yeah. And then they decided how are we going to, how are we going to fix every one of these things? And so that's really how Christian Brothers was, was born is based on solving problems in an industry that doesn't have the best reputation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're still not, we're still higher than lawyers, but not much, <laughs> you know, yeah. as far well, as it's people, hard. people I mean, I, I had uh, Pirelli tires changed out of my car mm -hmm. and uh, I did not, notice it until a couple of days later when someone had asked me what tires I get it was back east where you have four seasons and salt roads. Yeah. So I said, I get Pirelli. He's like, you don't have Pirelli tires. And I looked and I didn't. And so I drove to the automobile, the automotive place that I had my tires changed with all my other stuff and uh, made them put my other ones on. I was like, I won't say anything, but you're going to put them back on. I mean, it, just stuff like that. It's really sensational, but it happens. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate, um, but it's, um, you know, you, you don't have to do business that way. You really no. don't. Um, and so I just really um, liked, I liked the guy that owned the shop. Uh, Larry and I are still very good friends. And uh, um I just liked what they were doing. And so I thought, you know, and I asked my wife and, I, and you know, I, after the Edward Jones thing, I wasn't sure she'd ever let me go into business again. <laughs> and, uh, and I told her about it and, and I, she knew I was bored with what I was doing. And she says, well, 
And so I, I did, and I told her about it, and I, but I didn't say much. And then I, then I put together a little presentation for her, and then I presented it, and uh, and and then and then she said, "Well, let's go, let's see if we even qualify." And so, so we started down that road, and then by the time we we were deemed qualified, they said, "Well, you're going to have to move because the you know we were living in Florida, so the Tampa area was full up." And I said, well, if I'm going to move away from my church and all my friends, we're going to we're going to move back to the northwest where we came from. And so but not too close to Seattle, because yeah. that's a whole nother story. And I I, uh, I asked them what they thought about Boise, Idaho. And and I was just pulling that out because I used to come here in the 80s. Um, For what? So my best friend in the Coast Guard was from CUNA. Oh, okay. so we would come over here, but we would come over when we'd have three days off and we would just. We'd go out and, you know, out in the woods and shoot guns and, you know, ride motorcycles and you name it. Just had a great time. And I remember back then you used to hit all the, you know, you hit these pheasants with the car all the time. <laughs> and uh, so and we were thinking, oh, that's kind of weird. And so so that was my memory of, of Boise. And so when, as we started researching the market, I thought, well, it's really changed a lot. Um, but it still wasn't the greatest place on earth to live yet. Um, so still kind of risky and so we 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 put the first uh, meridian you know first uh christian brothers in the state of idaho in meridian so i think it's so interesting that you showed me a picture of when you first got there and you were in a field yeah, and there was just, just a mud hole and yeah. now i there are so many and it's just there's so many it's so developed and really is a great I mean, what did you do? Throw a dart? How'd you figure that out? Well, the the guys at, at our corporate office have some magic machinery that they can, you know, they Pinpoint. polish their crystal ball, and, <laughs> and they they came up with the the location. And it is a nice location. It's perfect, right next to a gas station, and it's near yeah. a high school. So yeah, it's just right in. So you know, with automotive, uh, people get their cars fixed near where they live or where they work. Now, if they choose where they live, well, you've got to figure out a way to get them to work. And so we have a free shuttle and we do that. I do like that. That's yeah. that's a nice option. It, it, it wasn't important for that day, but sometimes, because I haven't had kids at home. My, my kids are 30 and 31. Yeah. So I, and one lives in California. So it's very hard for me to figure out how to get a ride and I don't have I do not need two vehicles so that is right. a really nice very nice yeah you know our, just our goal is really when your car comes in to have it done within one day yeah you know, unless it's you know something major that has to be done like a new new engine or what have you <laughs> our goal is to have you out in a day so generally if we can get you to work by the end of your work day we'll be picking you up to put you back in your car yeah and uh, so um, and you have tires now too. Yeah, we've always had tires. So we're not a tire store, but we do tires. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. That was, I heard someone say that at the networking group. I didn't know you had tires. Yeah, <laughs> I guess, we have Pirellis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do. It's so different out here. I mean, I, I have to remind myself like every third year or something. I mean, in New Hampshire, you have your summer tires and your winter tires, and you buy them every other year, right. but you're always buying tires. Yeah. So the tire business in the New England states are, it's. And there's a lot of people here who have winter tires and um, yeah. every other season tires, and we do a fair amount of changing those out. Uh, I just go for the happy medium and. Yep. Hope, hope the snow plow gets there before I do. <laughs> well, I know you've been living in Florida forever, so yeah, I I know how to drive in the snow. <laughs> that was, it was fun for my kids. They thought, oh, I've got an all-wheel drive vehicle. That means it'll drive like dry pavement. No. Mm-hmm. Well, we have that. We always had that with um, New Yorkers coming up for skiing, and uh, it, it just was comical. Because they would have their big, huge, all-wheel drive vehicles, and you'd see them. We, they'd pass you, and it would be like, "Ooh, you really shouldn't be going more than 40. It's a huge snowstorm. And then you see them and, laying on their side down oh, the yeah. road and you know, smashed up. <laughs> or just even in, you know, off the side. So that was, it's interesting. But uh, yeah. so now, now, how long have you had this? So we, we opened the store in 2014. So it's okay. been five years here just in May. Now, how are your children um, liking non-Florida weather? 
Well, um, the weather wasn't such a thing, and the culture was another. So, so my Very kids were different. all Southerners when they came here. And uh, one son um, solved the culture problem by joining the Air Force. Um, and then my oldest, uh, who's in the hair business, uh, yeah. she, uh, we've talked about her, she, um, she's, she's begrudgingly becoming a northerner. <laughs> and, uh, and then my youngest, uh, she got tied in with uh, FFA. Uh, oh, that's so good. Which has been such a, a wonderful thing for her and, and really has given her, she's got a full ride scholarship to CSI because of her involvement. Yeah. I don't think people know what a great school CSI is. And um, I am so happy with, I have several students who have gone. I've recommended that they go. I love, I, I can call up, I'm on a first name basis. They really, really help the students with yeah. any form of problem that they have. Well, and they, I really they, like that. They've got a PhD behind every tree down there. It's not a bunch of just guys with a teaching certificate. Yeah. But they're, and I like that they have college. articulation agreements. We talked about to mm -hmm. Bozeman, which is another agriculture school, because it yeah. sounds like your which daughter's thanks to really... You, your daughter's look, my daughter's looking into that as well. Oh, and, it's yeah. that, that was such a... It's a dream school for someone who wants to do what your daughter wants to do because they, the ag community in Bozeman is so supportive. Of it. They want to see ag students and they really give a lot of money. Well, and the same thing at CSI. They, um, you know, I wanted my daughter to go to CWI, live at home, and, and just stay home and take care of all our animals. And, and uh, she really was drawn there um, a lot of th through her FFA contacts. So, yeah. You know, that's the thing. A young person in FFA learns a lot more than just, you know, how to plant plants or, you know, pet sheep. It's, well, I if people should watch how they debate. They have this it, huge yeah. debate. They have speech. They have to defend certain um, when they go up against legislation, which is they get a problem. Yeah. Um, I've been a judge actually for four, I think four series of different events that they had. And um, over in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, my daughter's that, been there several times. And yeah. Then, and it's fun judging. Yeah. It's really fun judging. No, and she's, my daughter, she was this quiet, you know, kept to herself person when she came here. And and I'll tell you, she's not the same girl. She, she, um, she actually was telling me, I want to go to CSI. I think it's going to be a better thing. And so being the business guy I am, I said, well, you need to make a presentation and sell me on it. So she did, and she said, and, and you have to come to the school. So I went to the school, and she had arranged for us to sit in a class. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that was kind of the last draw, but I was getting more and more um, warming up to the idea just because yeah. I was meeting people down there. And then I sat in a classroom where all the kids looked like my daughter. They all had ball caps on and dirty boots, and they were <laughs> talking about uh, uh, antibiotics and in agriculture or in, in livestock and, yeah. and it was being taught by a veterinarian that was just visiting to teach that specific class and um, you know I was very impressed and uh, and of course CSI is like a like a you'd think you're on a four-year campus they've got dorms they got the whole nine yards and, I, I do like that I hope so. I hope CWI can eventually do the same thing because I do think it's a nice transition um, and, you know, if it's affordable, if it works, if it depends on the student's personality. But I think um, experiencing dorm life is helpful. Yeah. And, she, and I'm all for, you know, you get through school with as little debt, if no debt at yeah. all, because you, that's just going to be a hurdle you have to overcome in your life going mm -hmm. forward. It'll keep you from getting getting where you want to go. And I... Uh, so, you know, one of the things I've told all my kids is go to go to community college. Um, you can learn the same things. Just make sure they have a connection to the destination you want to go. Yeah. That's, I well, that one person. thing that has was announced, we had CWI here mm -hmm. and um, the, the one stop uh, admissions director. And this fall is the start of articulation agreements because previously I had students that were at CWI, loved the program and their credits, not all of them transfer. would not transfer. So the state of Idaho 
and then he he had just announced it on our um, it, it's in the other career, admissions in our admissions um, you'll see a couple of admissions people and he um, said that they are now all of the course numbers are going to be the same so when your daughter takes an English class or an accounting class or business egg class it will all be the same no matter where she transfers if she chose to do in the state of Idaho. Bozeman is actually very good about transfers. I've had several students who transfer from community college to that school or go in immediately and they really that's another location where they it's just so gorgeous there and they have longevity with their professors and they are professors more often than not are the ones teaching the which is good. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was the key for me. I, I went to a community college. And my degree says University of Washington School right. of Business. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it, it's, but I I wanted to be in smaller classrooms. Mm -hmm. And and there's, you know, there are guys with PhDs running around on these college, these community college campuses. Yeah. And the reason is they want they want to teach, not write papers. Well, and that's what happened with me. I was at the at that point. It was called College for Lifelong Learning, and the three quarters of the professors who were teaching at the community college were Dartmouth professors, which is an Ivy League, and they really liked the difference. And they and they said they were teaching it very similarly. It it just yeah. they just really liked the difference of I was. Gosh, I want to say I was 28 when I went to community college. So, you know, frightened, listening to every word, making sure. Yeah. <laughs> so they said it was a different group of people. And you also had high school students that were fresh out of high school. And it was it was really enjoyable. I I would definitely stick with the same path. But I also know that it doesn't always work yeah. depending upon what you want to go into. It does, and that's. I was just very fortunate, and it's not for everybody, but yeah. uh, worked well for us. And and uh, you know, so now today I own my own business, and and uh, joining that, I've got ten people that work for me, and we're looking at expanding into another location here. I'm hoping we'll start that ball rolling next year, and and uh, and then we have uh, another location, another family starting at Christian Brothers here in the uh, Meridian area. And so I'll be mentoring and helping helping with them to get them up to speed as well. So, oh, that'll be good. So it's uh, it's always always exciting and never dull. <laughs> so if there was a student who really was interested in the automotive field in any way, shape, or form, and really mm -hmm. thought they wanted to also own their own business, so this is a this is a franchise that you got involved with. What's the the pluses, the pros, the cons, what would you tell them or recommend that they do to prepare for something like that? Well, if, if I was, you know, talking to a student, I would say get some technical training and, and some experience in that field. Um, my, my experience came in the military. I also had a brief stint working for the Kenworth truck company in the factory. Uh, assembling trucks, I found that wasn't for me, but uh, but you but learned. I learned a lot, and I learned how things are put together, things how how they work. Uh, if you really like that, you know, get in there, become a technician, be be certified. There's so many paths you can go down with with just being a technician, uh, and and then and from there you can grow into because you have to understand the the what it is we're doing, and as we're fixing vehicles it's a technical field there are more computers in a car now than there was on this you know spaceships going to the moon yeah you know it's it, they're very technical and the future in automotive is we're not going to get away from cars no matter what our government would like to see us do um, that just isn't going to happen in the next 50 years we're yeah. still tied to these vehicles where we're in these cars but the systems that are um, propelling those vehicles are going to change and they're going to be more more technical um, I think exciting I think Tesla is a very cool thing uh, that's coming out but it still has wheels brakes tires um, doesn't have an exhaust pipe doesn't have oil in it but uh, it's got a lot of other yeah. things and, and so a lot of these things even nowadays even even your your normal car now has so many computers on board 
and then with all the collision avoidance systems that we're seeing now, those are really the pre-runners for fully automated autonomous drive. Vehicles. What is your thought on that? I was going to ask that. Just out of curiosity. Well, it's coming uh, mm-hmm. because the, the roads are becoming so full of cars and human beings uh, acting independently will always choose for themselves, not the collective good. And so we will always have <laughs> uh, traffic jams and, you know, in, in accidents and things like that. And so the, the autonomous drive will come in to where everything works collectively within vehicles. You'll even see vehicles communicating with each other so that they know the vehicle ahead is slowing down or whatever, and they'll match. And, and even now, you've got smart cruise control. If you put a cruise control on and you're following a car that slows down, you'll slow down with it, and you'll speed back up. There's still some things. You, you still have to manually engage those things. But um, then all the collision avoidance systems we see mm-hmm. on these cars, those are really just prototypes that we're all, as a society, paying for because that now we're looking at about an average of $10,000 in cost of every new vehicle that comes out now is just in these collision avoidance and, you know, radar um, controlled cruise controls and things like that. But these are all prototype for how the kind of things you have to have in an autonomous car. And so those systems are all there. They're just not you know, the, the, what's going to, what's going to, I think, fill the gap is some sort of artificial intelligence that's going to come in to fill the gap between all these little systems to make them work in so that they're seamless, so that a human being, uh, it takes as much of the human being judgment out of the equation as possible. So uh, I think it's exciting. Uh, it's, it, it, it is, it, it, I really feel that it guarantees that the automotive repair business is always going to be around. It's just going to evolve. It's going to change into what that looks like. You know, a guy maybe 30 years from now won't have grease on his shirt, yeah. you know, because everything he's doing is through a keyboard. Or, you know, if he is pulling, you know, you know tires, and, you know, they haven't figured out a new way to do tires, you know, unless they come up with a way to hover or something, which completely possible, you know, the yeah. way we're going. But I think it's exciting. And the, the amount of, Areas for you know satisfying curiosity and exploration and discovery are just wide open in that field, and and I think it's it's just going to get better and better. So, what is your favorite car make and model in year? Um, well, there's two ways to look at that. One, um, uh, I drive a Toyota pickup. Okay. Uh, I drive it because uh, I own the shop. That does not give me head of the line privileges. In fact, it gives me the back of the line privileges um, or non privileges. But you know, so I, I like the de- Toyota for its dependability and um, just economy of of, of being. Um, but that's my everyday driver. So my I have a lot of favorites. I I really like the Tesla. I really would like to buy one just so I could pull it apart and see what's inside of it. But uh, you know, you can't do that either. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I, I like, um, you know, Corvettes. I'm a Corvette guy, so. Oh, yeah. do you have one? I do not. So I have Just a business some... instead. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you have a happy wife instead. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. I, uh... And you don't need your Corvette being all over town with your daughter and her, you know, her... My, my daughter and her stinky boots. Yeah, I no. could always tell when they were in my car. I would have to stop before I got out of my driveway and oh, back gosh. up and get the, you know. Well, my my daughter's car was in the in my shop for a week. We had to put a new motor in it, and uh, so in the meantime, she drove mom's car, and she works on a dairy, mm-hmm. and she likes to park with the windows down. And unfortunately, what, what, well, one of the things you don't think about is when there's dust on a dairy, you got to think about what is that dust made out of? It's made out of, you know, cow byproducts. Uh-huh. So when that dust flies into your mom's car and then you roll up the windows and leave it sit overnight, guess what it smells like in there? <laughs> Mom was not happy. Oh, you yeah. Know, daughter doesn't mind because in her 97 Subaru, she <laughs> Well, and they it's just adjust truck. to the smell. Yeah, they just don't even. Smell. I mean, it just is but, like but mom just hay. Yeah. Oh, back seat hay. Oh yeah, everywhere. 
Oh, it was, but it's so great. I mean, you cannot live without agriculture. You need people. I love how it's just developing the whole field. There's so much to do with it, and we should be paying attention to it, or we're going to have some trouble. It is, and it, and really, we can talk about you know flying cars and everything else. At the end of the day, we all got to eat. Yeah, uh, and uh, and we want to farm fresh. We, we have to have you know animal husbandry as well as crops uh, and we've got to preserve the land for that and you know it, it, it's kind of disconcerting i mean growth is exciting but when they're you know burying really good farmland to put in a neighborhood you start wondering where are we that's gonna, scary where are we gonna get all the stuff that we're growing or there they were in other countries they were making hybrid cows that were just really weird looking yeah. I think it was in Australia and then they then they didn't know what to do with them because it wasn't working out like they thought no, so they had this weird are reject that too. oh yeah it's just not going to be the same but yeah. so tell us again we're going to add your link tell us again where to find you how do we get a hold of you how can someone make an appointment so well we're in Meridian Idaho and, and so our our, our uh, best way is our website is cbac.com forward slash meridian okay. and uh, you can make an appointment there you can see all our services that are available our, our phone number is 208-888-0070 you can call for an appointment as well so, yeah it's very easy very very easy yeah so we we come in every morning with a, a bunch of uh, people you know at night in their leisure on their computer on their cell phone uh, they, they make appointments and and we get them coming in all the time. Yeah. So, and you should look at his testimonials because they are fantastic. And if you have younger children, I think it's super important um, to teach them how to pick out and select an appropriate um, place to get your car taken care of. It makes all the difference in the world. So thank yeah. you very much. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday with our networking group. Yes. Very excited to go again this week since you'll be our featured president. Oh, yes, I know exactly what he is. Yes. I'm doing an assessment with everybody. It's actually fun. Yep. Okay, thank excited. you so much. Thank you. It's really a pleasure. Bye now.